Hello, welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are doing their best. The studio is still incredibly hot, so I have not been able to get back in there, but trust me, trust me, it's happening soon. For the moment, uh, we got one more um, little guy. <laughs> I think this is the biggest one I've ever uh, uh, had on this show. Uh, so this is a Stryker SDC HD. I think that's the whole name of the thing, and it kind of says exactly what it is right here on the front. High definition digital capture. Uh, so we've got an LCD screen here. We've got, uh, this is a, a CD-ROM, as you'll see later. Uh, we have a USB port on the front. And all this kind of screams computer right off the bat, right? Uh, but then if we spin it around, yeah. So right off the bat, it's obviously a PC, right? <laughs> It'd be pretty hard to miss that. But what's interesting about this one is that it's a full-size PC. Sometimes when you see this cutout, it just means there's like a mini ITX board in there that's no bigger than the cutout itself. But in this case, obviously, we can see with all the uh, PCI brackets here that this has a full-size board uh, with the full-size backplane. Now, I usually pass on machines like this because... Well, it's just a normal PC, right? Like a, a lot of the stuff that makes me intrigued by little guys has to do with what they, they had to do to miniaturize them. Well, this is just gonna be a completely normal motherboard with just some cards plugged into it, right? So I tend to be less interested in the normal computers, but in this case, there's definitely some intriguing things going on. The power supply is not one, <laughs> right? That's obviously a completely ordinary ATX supply. Also, um, we've got this guy here. This, um, this looks, like a grounding post? Uh, oh yeah, it is actually, I can see there. It's got the, um, I believe that's the static electricity symbol. You, you leave this thing plugged in so that it's grounded through the IEC cable. And when you're working on it, you just clip your, uh, your wristband on there and then it uh, grounds you through the case. Also, <laughs> a Kensington slot. I mean, sure, okay, because, well, uh, not to, to jump the gun too much here, but you probably figured out that this is medical equipment, right? This is an endoscopy recorder, so you're meant to plug in a camera that you shut. Well, we won't talk about where you put it. There's many options. But anyway, this would have been in a procedure room, and, uh, well, stuff just gets stolen out of hospitals constantly. So it makes sense they'd have the Kensington lock on there, although I, I kind of wonder if that would do the job, because this thing... Mm, weighs a good 20 pounds, something like that. It's a lot of inertia if you're running. <laughs> if you just grabbed this thing and just took off, you could probably tear the Kensington lock right out of it. A fun experiment, which I won't be performing. We've got two cards in here. One of them is a Firewire card. Womp womp, nothing exciting there. And then the other one appears to be a dual head graphics card. Um, maybe like an early Quadro, something like that. You know, we can tell this machine's got some years on it because, well, for one thing, there's composite and S-video. <laughs> inputs up here that sort of gives the game away uh also usb 1.1 or 2 right uh and um ps2 um parallel etc so this thing's got some years on it for sure but you know it could have had one of the uh the early like single slot quadro cards or something it doesn't however the only actual video output on this thing is this guy and that's really interesting we're going to get into that later but i i suspect if you plug into this you won't actually get anything out We'll talk about that once we open it, but I, I think there's some fascinating things going on with the video output. But what this actually is, is a capture card. Um, you may be able to see, it actually says out here and in there. So what you do is you'd plug in a DVI device that you want to capture, it captures it, and then it spits the signal back out here, uh, probably through just an, uh, like a, an analog repeater, basically, so that you get zero latency between the input and output. And that's because uh, if you're doing a, a procedure and you're using the camera to see what you're doing, in order to get your low latency monitor feeds, so you can actually see what you're working on, uh, you just pass it through here, plug this into a monitor, uh, and then you don't care if this thing you know, has a delay due to the, the processing time of the card. Likewise, you can see up here that the uh, S-Video and composite inputs ripple through to outputs for exactly the same purpose. Although a strange thing about that is they have a second set of inputs here that is not replicated. And I don't know, um, they're not labeled one and two, A and B, anything like that. So yeah, I don't really have an explanation for that. You'd think that they would have called them, you know, channel one and channel two, but maybe they just, um, no, I've got no idea. I guess I could check the manual. So they've made several versions of this thing. There's the SDC HD, the SDC Ultra, the SDC 3. Uh, they all seem fairly similar. Oh, here we go, but this looks like the original model. Oh, and uh, by the way, what you're supposed to actually do with these things is uh, you're supposed to uh, buy this along with like three or four other boxes. Um, while this is loading, I can tell you that this USB port here is labeled uh, Sydney. 
Sydney is Stryker's operating room automation product. And so you'd buy a Sydney central control box and then you plug all your other equipment into it. Uh, so for instance, when you're doing endoscopy, uh, you have a camera that's going places and that camera needs a source of light. Nowadays, we might put ultra bright uh, like Cobb LEDs on the end of the thing. I, I don't know, but, but maybe we would. But uh, 20 years ago, and I think this thing is um, 20 years old probably, we didn't have those. You just couldn't get a bright light safely into a tiny space like that. So what you do instead is you'd have a, a fiber optic bundle in the cable feeding the camera. And uh, at the near end, you'd put a really, really, really bright light focused into the end of that fiber bundle. And then uh, that would illuminate the inside of wherever you're putting the camera. And in addition, while there were uh, USB and Firewire endoscopy cameras and Stryker did sell them, uh, there were also a number that just spit out like raw uh, digital RGB and so you need to have a converter box to work with that. So Stryker would sell you a whole stack, a literal stack of equipment. You'd buy this, you'd buy the light source, you'd buy the camera um, converter box, uh, several other things, and then you'd buy a Sydney unit that ties them all together and gives you a touchscreen for controlling it all. All right, and unfortunately that uh, ended up being a pamphlet and not a manual. And I've looked at some of the other manuals uh, for other models and they're all completely different. So uh, yeah, I have no idea what the, the second input here is for. I'm guessing it's just a, a second input. Anyway, so you can also connect uh, audio input so you can have a microphone in the room. Obviously you wanna be able to narrate uh, what you're doing as you're doing it. Uh, the audio out probably for rippling to a backup recorder. Uh, then you've got a remote input for capture and record. Uh, again, I don't have the manual, so I can't be sure, but I would guess that that means record a still frame and start recording video. So you could have uh, little uh, buttons or, or probably, I guess, foot pedals, most likely, uh, for controlling this thing. And that's pretty much it. This thing is, is basically exactly what it appears to be. I mean, I am going to open it up and show you some of the parts inside. They're a little exotic, but they're basically what you'd expect. Mostly, it's just cool that they built it in this specific form factor, and it makes me wonder if I could turn it into something uh, a bit more useful because, well, uh, obviously, given the, the apparent age of the thing, it's not going to be super fantastic for, for capturing video from modern devices, but it's a great chassis for the application, right? Especially with the touchscreen on the front. So I like the idea of converting it into something I can use at my bench here for these videos. Uh, but, well, there's problems with that that we'll, um, we'll get into once I open it. For the moment, let's fire it up because it actually works. Oh, one quick thing before we go. This actually says DVI slash VGA. So I believe uh, with the addition of uh, a simple adapter, this should be able to capture HD VGA as well. And possibly like um, uh, lower lower resolution RGB videos with like composite sync. That's often a feature that's quietly built into this sort of thing. So kind of curious about that, but I don't think I have stuff to test it with at the moment. Of course, the thing that's always cool about touchscreen devices, we don't need a keyboard or mouse. We will later. Oh, I thought that was some dust, but it's actually uh, a little bit of a nick in the screen. Huh, bummer. Anyway, this being ATX era, it's got a soft power switch. Oh, and that is incredibly loud. Well, we'll just have to put up with it. Mm. Now, I have concerns. So there's no picture, and I had this happen when I tested it before, and I basically just opened it up and jostled some things, and I was able to get it working. Oh, oh, okay, it just wanted to be rebooted. Not sure why, but it seems like when you turn it on from a, a cold power off, it has a tendency not to uh, to start up on the first try. Man, that screen starts out real dim. This is from the CCFL era, so we're going to kind of struggle to see a picture. Unsurprisingly, we've got XP embedded on here. You can tell it's XP embedded because it loaded that fast off of, uh, spoiler warning, a spinning hard disk. All right, we're going, we're going. <laughs> All these embedded machines, it's its an absolute foregone conclusion that on boot up, you're going to see a little console window for a moment. So application verified. By the way, compared to a lot of other uh, little guys with like kiosk style software on them, Stryker uh, did a, a magnificent job of integrating this. Like a lot of the time you can really see sort of some rough edges, but here it uh, it just starts up right into the software and it's very slick. You, you really can't tell that it's a Windows based machine. <laughs> Except there was that console again for just a moment. Oh, this is interesting. Um, when I fired this up before, it said images and or videos were not saved. But, um, well, I, I, I did. I, I put a USB drive in there. I told it to save images. It, it saved nothing. And now it's saying that um, 
they were not saved. I wonder if it just says this anytime you power it up, uh, but don't hit like close task before you shut it down. I'll bet that's what it is. It probably doesn't actually check to see if there were any uh, images and or videos. Anyway, we'll just hit no. I love this interface, by the way. Like they really did a nice job. Uh, they made a, a disabled version of, of each icon that's got the, the classic Windows disabled uh, visual effect of just having the little um, beveled embossed icon. Uh, and here it is. And it honestly looks kind of fantastic. So as you'd expect from a device like this, it starts out just like ready to go. So we're here and we just start entering uh, information about our patient. Uh, where is shift? I'm sorry, I'm just suddenly realizing there's no shift key. Maybe it doesn't do lowercase? I'll bet that's exactly what it is. That does decrease the complexity of, of, of entering information, uh, which decreases the likelihood of screwing it up. Uh, he was born uh, 124 years ago, that seems likely. Oh, that's cute. Gives you a little little calendar. It's kind of hard to read. I wish those numbers were uh, white. It's it's from like 2004. What do you expect? Do we have a list of surgeons? Um, ooh, we do, and I'm going to blur that out because I've just realized that this <laughs> this was not wiped. Um, I thought this had like a stock copy of the software on it, but no. Oh wow, we can just delete surgeons right from here. There's no protection. Ooh, that doesn't seem good. Huh. You'd think you'd have to go into some sort of maintenance mode to do this, but it's just letting me do it. Hmm, curious. Um, well, in that case, can I just add a surgeon? I'll be your doctor today. All right, what procedure are we doing? Uh, okay. Well, this gives us an idea where this is being used. So arthroscopy, right ankle, left ankle, uh, cystoscopy, cystoscopy. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> just why did I say it like that? Arthroscopy? That's probably right. Cystoscopy? Hysteroscopy? Left wrist ganglion. You know, that's what kept Dr. Bashir from being valedictorian. Okay, so that's our patient. And one thing I notice here is there's no, like, uh, save patient info button. You just have to, it looks like, save the whole thing at once. And it looks like you can only save externally. This, this thing has, like, I think an 80 gig hard drive in it, but it won't save anything locally. You've got to either write it to disk, to USB, uh, or to a network server. And I guess there's arguments for that, though it still seems odd. Now let's see if the disk will eject. Nope. So I had trouble with this earlier, and I attempted to, um, to help the drive eject, and I just ended up uh, sort of ripping off this, uh, this bezel here, unfortunately. But as soon as I did that, the disk ejected, so I was wondering if this was actually keeping the disk from ejecting. Oh. There we go. Yeah, I ripped the tabs right off of it, although I suspect it wasn't my fault. I think maybe somebody who came before me did that. I could definitely hear that drive struggling, so let's see if we can give it some, some help here. There we go. And yeah, so it's a, a completely ordinary CD burner. Maybe DVD burner. I haven't checked. They just uh, put this little bezel on here to make it look better. So let's go back to our project. Oh, right. <laughs> so we're going to hit the home button here, but of course... I love this about industrial PCs. This happens all the time. They stole this icon just right out of Windows. It's not really stealing, but that's not the point, right? Like they made custom icons for everything else, but they had a home.ico sitting in the Windows folder. So they're like, let's just take that. Anyway, anyway, uh, what we're here for is to capture. So let's see if we can capture. All right, no composite input. Oh, and you know what? It says composite too. So I guess there are just two independent inputs. I just noticed this, there's an auto print feature. So uh, Stryker did sell a printer to go with this system. I have not looked it up, but dollars to donuts, it is a dye sublimation printer because that was a quick way to get high quality uh, color prints that were like already, um, you know, sealed. They're not uh, color fast. So if you spill like uh, uh, various solvents or water on them, they're not gonna run like you would get with an inkjet print. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm betting that right now there's a picture of a die sub printer on the screen over this thing. But anyway, let's um, get a video signal for this thing. Sure, why not? <clears throat> Oops. Oh, I hit the power button as I was rotating it, so it shut off. Hopefully I could reload my uh, previous session. Okay, good, it reloaded my session. Uh, however, um, while I was uh, uh, waiting for this to boot back up, I decided to hook up the uh, VGA, and I've confirmed that, uh, yeah, there's no there's no video output. It's just the touchscreen itself, which kind of sucks, right? Um, if there's no way to record what's going on on the UI while it's uh, running, that's uh, kind of a bummer, actually. Anyway, we should have a video input now. Okay, composite to okay, and where is picture? 
we should have a picture at this time. Or does it not actually display one until you hit record? Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh, I guess um, tapping that button actually takes the picture. <laughs> All right, I suppose. What does this field do? Is this, do, can we label it? Hmm, it doesn't look that way. Let's go to video mode. Let's see if that gets us a, a live view. No, I don't think it does. Uh, well, if we hit the camera button in this mode, oh, okay, it just takes another still. So this always takes a still. What about this? Okay, this shows us like the gallery just just for a moment, just for like a second or two. Huh, so if we're in still mode and we hit record, what happens? Well, okay, it says it's recording. Oh, so um, maybe this thing never gives you a live view. I guess that would uh, probably reduce stress on the CPU and, and other resources. What happens if we hit play? Huh, yeah, sure enough, it was recording. Well, sorry this is so dim, I'm doing my best. So I guess the preview outputs are actually essential because without those, it seems that there's no way to see what you're capturing at all. I, I can comprehend that, but I can't say that I agree with it. Oh, right. <laughs> there's no ripple through on that input. So we'll have to switch to composite one. Okay, I'm not getting a picture from this, so I think I have to go in and change which input we're using. No, it says status, no signal. I wonder what's going on here. Oh, okay, this is weird. Um, so we're now getting the output from the camera on composite one, even though I'm plugged into the same port that was composite two before, and the ripple output from composite one is working. Well, I'll take it. So in this interface, we are allowed to see a live preview of what this thing is capturing, uh, which is good because I think we need to bump up the brightness a little bit. It, it was, looked pretty dim before. Uh, let's go a little harder. Let's just bump the brightness to 50. There we go. That's looking okay. But what I notice is that when I wave this around, it's uh, 60 FPS over there, but it's only 30 here. And there's some decent choppiness. I can see some um, uh, some V-Sync issues. So my guess is they're not using the uh, hardware accelerated overlay for previewing this, which is really quite unfortunate. It, it seems like this machine should support it. Here they must just be uh, capturing the image and writing it in software, which... Well, you can do, but you get the lower frame rate and it put places more burden on the CPU, so I don't really see a reason to do it that way. That's odd, uh, and it's probably also why this thing can't show you a preview while you're in the uh, the normal recording interface. That does not seem like the best decision on Stryker's part, but what do, what do I know? By the way, just while we're in here, let's uh, take a quick tour of the control panel. So obviously you can adjust uh, all your analog uh, stuff here. There are digital inputs, although uh, I don't know how to get to those yet. And we're going to go ahead and save as defaults, I think. What does hide advanced do? Okay, yeah, that just limits it to uh, which input you're using. And what does this do? Does this rotate it? Flip screen, one, quad, side. I don't know what that means. Uh, and camera setting, 1088 or 988. Those are models of Stryker uh, endo camera, and I have no idea what the difference is between them. Also, I guess it'll do PAL. Will it do Ccam? Wow, that took a really long time to change. Yeah, it takes like 20 to 30 seconds to switch from NTSC to PAL and back. What could I be doing all that time? Where's my video input? Sir? I seem to have confused it. Oh. Oh. What? What? <laughs> you saw it. It said composite one before, right? Oh, but you know what? Also, this was grayed out a minute or two ago. So the UI was actually jammed. It wasn't showing us the current input. So what else do we have in here? We also have S-Videos 1 and 2. Uh, and then here are our options for uh, input on the DVI port. So again, 1088 and 988 are the camera models. You can choose uh, to capture either DVI or VGA, although they're calling it uh, by the, the the standard resolution name, so SXGA. So either 1280 by 1024, 1024 by 768, oh, or uh, 1024 again. So this software only supports those two resolutions. I would be really surprised if the capture card itself can't do better, but you wouldn't want to expose that to the end user because they could pick the wrong resolution and totally trash a, uh, you know, a medical record. So we'll mess with those later, but uh, for the moment, uh, let's see, we've got the, the printer interface, obviously. Uh, I assume this would work with any Windows printer, most likely. Audio, um, we can... Oh, okay, you can actually... Oh, you can capture audio through the Sydney module. So I believe that... Um, like I said earlier, they had this central control system, and I believe it actually had an audio recorder as part of the system. So I guess that would allow you to actually slurp in the audio from the uh, Sydney uh, digitizer. That's that's pretty cool. 
and then the mic is just going to be the uh, dedicated jack on the back, uh, which is interesting. It makes you wonder if they're using the onboard sound card, because the motherboard already has a mic jack and a speaker jack, so why not just use that? My guess is that they're actually using the um, uh, audio recorder on the dedicated capture card in here. Next tab, this is where we tell it what formats we want to save in. So obviously we've got um, uh, like our still and uh, video image formats, but also this confirms that the thing does write DVDs. You can tell it to uh, not uh, take up tons of space on your USB with videos because in these days, if this was like 2004, 2006, USB drives were still quite small. I guess you can encrypt it, huh? I wonder what type of encryption it uses. Probably not a very good one. What do we have for image formats? JPEG, oh, JPEG 2000. TIFF, PNG, TGA, raw bitmap, it's got everything. And then by default it records MPEG-1. Oh, but you could do MPEG-2, oh, terrific. And MPEG-4, oh. And that's it, just uh, various flavors of MPEG. Well, we definitely want MPEG-4, right? Right, you know, now that I think of it, ooh, maybe we don't because the bit rate that it uses might be crap. I'll record a couple of test clips and we'll see. All right, then we got network, uh, oh. I guess the uh, network server this thing uses would just be an FTP server. So uh, I don't even know if Stryker would have sold you a custom device for that. Uh, obviously, we got our IP address information. Boy, this looks tedious to, to fill out. Uh, customize. Oops. Uh, once again, there's the name of the hospital. I'll go ahead and blur that out. <laughs> um, but this is where we can um, uh, specify our list of possible procedures. Uh, this is where we can uh, basically determine which department this thing is in. And I guess, hmm... Oh, I guess these are, uh, this is uh, for uh, pre predetermined annotations. You can just uh, uh, plug in like Mad Libs, I'm guessing. This SMS thing, uh, this is, oh, here we go. Striker Software Management Site. I'm going to go ahead and assume that this is a licensed management system. So Striker would have sold you a piece of software you'd install on a server, or they'd sell you a whole server, uh, whose only job was to sit there and tell devices like this what they're allowed to do. And that, you know, makes all the difference between a $10,000 device and a $40,000 device. And then we just have the date and time and a touchscreen calibrate, which I'm going to stay away from because it's working just fine the way it is. All right, so let's get down to business. Uh, we're going to want to record some video here and see if this thing is spectacular or so-so. So let me adjust uh, our, our camera here. All right, let's go to video mode. Let's record. Okay, and as expected, we still don't get a preview here, but I'm just going to point this thing at myself. All right, there we go. Uh, by the way, this is with the um, the Sony VX1000, which I probably will never do a video about because I was not a skater <laughs> back in 1998 or, or, or 2000. Uh, but, man, I can see why it got so popular so fast. This is a really good-looking picture, <laughs> honestly. Like, this this looks terrific. Even over composite, I'll bet the S-Video and the, uh, the Firewire look a lot better. All right, so that was the MPEG-4. Let's go back in and switch it to MPEG-2. I think it'll look better. Oh, that's interesting. I just saw the uh, the capture card, like, reboot. All right, here we are recording on MPEG-2, and um, what I'm probably going to do is grab a couple of frames of, like, my hair, because <laughs> that's really what's going to make the difference, uh, and, and show those side by side. But really, I should probably go back and record an MPEG-1 as well if I'm going to do that. Man, I should always have uh, this this camera set up with this monitor on my desk. This looks this looks fantastic. This would add a lot to my bench videos, wouldn't it? All right, here we go. This is uh, MPEG one, and man, I'm kind of wondering if this is even going to be legible because I'm looking at the uh, the monitor over here, and the thumbnail looks really dim. So hopefully, we're getting anything useful, and I don't have to reshoot these. But uh, MPEG one is uh, hard limited to 1.5 megabits, as I recall. I don't think it can go higher. And at 1.5 megabits, it, it struggles to look decent at all, uh, even in the best of case. And I don't think this will be the best case. So we'll see what we get. It is encoding on a Pentium 4 class machine, so it might be able to put more math into the encoding than uh, an original MPEG-1 device would. But I, th I think this is going to look like shit. And real quick before we wrap up with that, let's just uh, switch this guy to PNG. All right, and then let's uh, just grab a couple of stills. Oh, that's cute. Whenever you take a still, it shows you the recent stills on the composite output, so you don't need to look at the monitor to see what just got grabbed. And the value of that is you've got, you know, a technician maybe looking at this thing, uh, but they're not the person who, who determines whether that was a good capture, right? Uh, the doctor needs to, to look at the screen and tell, okay, that was the picture I wanted. So you need to replicate it on uh, the standard definition output because that's what they're looking at. 
Uh, either that or there's no technician at all and they're just, you know, stepping on a pedal. So uh, that's, it makes perfect sense, but it's, just, I didn't expect it. Oh my God, that is, that is a really bad picture of me. Holy crap. I can't wait to see that. Okay, 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 okay. All right, now let's do something more productive. One question that I'm dying to answer is um, whether the Firewire ports on this thing were actually for hooking up cameras. I didn't find any evidence that Stryker sold Firewire cameras, but it's possible this thing will detect and use them. And I just remembered the fiasco of trying to get Firewire capture to work the last time I did this on an XP embedded machine. So I really don't expect this to work. Okay, so our camera should be in DB mode. Let's go to config. Let's see if we can pick that as an input. Yeah, yeah, no dice. I'm going to say that's that's probably not going to happen. So let's um let's set this guy aside. Now, the best place to get a DVI output that's going to be in the resolution range this once is from a PC. And we have one right here. So we're just going to use this. Fun fact. I have very close to no idea what's on this computer. I think it's some sort of Linux, but I have no idea if it's going to give us any kind of legible output. All right, let's uh, plug this bad boy in and see if we get anything. I should probably have set that to DVI first. Okay, computer went beep. I heard a relay click in this thing. Computer went beep again. Oh, no signal. Okay, let me save some time. I put another couple hours into this and I never got the DVI input working. I don't know why. Uh, it does seem possible to me that because this explicitly calls out the two different models of camera that they're actually expecting some kind of distinct signal from them like uh, maybe they were using a different color format maybe they were outputting um you know ycbcr whereas this guy's outputting rgb and i don't have a way to uh, to change that but in any case i switched over to vga and well as you can see uh, it is now working however it doesn't look very good <laughs> You should be seeing the raw capture now, and yeah, it's just all uh, low contrast, blown out. It's got streaks across it, that sort of thing. So clearly some low quality um, analog digital conversion is, is going on here. I already tried messing with the picture adjustments and nothing seems to make any difference. Uh, it just um, it just looks like crap. Uh, I'm kind of wondering if this thing is just falling out of calibration. Actually, you know what? Now that I think of it, there's an auto calibrate button here. What happens if I hit, oh, well that already looks a little bit better. Well, that made a little bit of a difference. Oh, you know what? It says use color bars for auto calibration. Maybe I actually need some SMPTE bars for this to calibrate correctly. All right, let's try this again. Wow, that was really fast. Did that take? Oh, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> that actually did fix it. Well, I mean, we still have some streaking. So there's still some issues going on with the um, the analog circuitry or my cabling or, or who knows what, but obviously this is much, much better. So uh, yeah, the, the value of calibrating the thing is, is now apparent. But now the real question is, what is this gonna capture? Because the signal type still says NTSC, makes me think that this is just gonna do it at, uh, at standard def. Let's actually start with a photo. Oh, and uh, it still does the overlay on the VGA output. So uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, intercepting the signal and modifying it, uh, not just passing it straight through. Here's what that photo looks like, by the way, and I'm guessing it's gonna be standard def. Now let's record a video. Okay, we're recording. Uh, I'm just gonna drag this window around some. Okay, yeah, we get the record indicator on the screen here too. Let's go in and set up a screensaver. If this is recording in uh, anything better than standard def, then uh, hopefully this will look good. Uh, if it isn't, then this is going to look absolutely terrible, and I'm pretty sure I know which one we're going to get. And, you know, in retrospect, capturing 1024 by 768 or, or 1280 video in this era at full frame rate, I, I think would have been just murder on the machine's hardware, whether it's dedicated or software-based. So I don't know what's going on with the DVI, why that's so picky, but the VGA seems to function exactly as one would expect. I'm gonna go ahead and just call this good so that I can turn this damn thing off because that fan is killing me. Oh wait, I'm a doofus. <laughs> I was gonna break out of the software and show you the rest of the OS. Naturally, we can just uh, plug in a normal keyboard to the front port here. You know, I have not checked, but I'm gonna assume I could use that to, to type. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so you're not limited to using the on-screen keyboard if you were worried. Anyway, while breaking up is hard to do, breaking out is not. Just hit Control-Alt-Delete and <laughs> there you go. So they set the SDC software as the Windows shell, which means that Explorer is not actually running right now. Uh, but if I just go in here and launch it, it'll open up a uh, file browser window. And from there, uh, we can go to about, this is how you find out which version of Windows you have. 
XP embedded. Uh, let's see, SP2. And it looks like we have 512 uh, megs of memory, or close enough. Actually, it said 515. So I wonder if it actually has more and some of it's being reserved for something. As is typical for an embedded system, there's not a whole lot on here, and it's also split into several different partitions. This may be because they're using the uh, Windows Enhanced Write filter, uh, which allows you to uh, basically make the OS and application drive immutable so that there's no way any sort of software malfeasance or malware uh, can screw up what's on the drive. Only the uh, data disk would be writable. Or it could be that they're just splitting these out so that if the OS gets corrupted, you can just re-image that partition. If the applications get corrupted, you can just re-image those and so on without having to wipe the and reload the entire machine. Oh, interesting. There's a, something in here called Invivio TV. I have no idea what this is. I've never heard of Invivio before. Anyway, there's not much else going on in the control panel. Uh, just a sound card driver. That's about it. Let's go into services real quick. Yeah, so I, I think if the uh, Windows Write Filter was in use, then we would see it show up here under a service called Enhanced Write Filter. So I think they just split up the uh, drive into partitions for convenience when re-imaging. Anyway, uh, as for the actual system hardware, this thing is running a Celeron 2.0, that's a P4 class. Oh, uh, and again, it shows up with uh, 504 megs of RAM. I'm, I must have done my math wrong earlier, so that is 512 minus a few megs for video memory. Then we just have the uh, 80 gig hard drive, just basic onboard Intel 82845 uh, graphics. Um, I, I think I mentioned this, but that is in fact a DVD burner. Uh, this display here, if you're curious, is only 800 by 600, which sucks, uh, kind of limits what I can ever do with it. I was really hoping it'd be 1024 by 768. Even that's pretty choked on a modern OS, but mm, yeah, I don't know if this thing has a future. Built-in 10100 Ethernet, um, single processor, no hyper-threading or anything. I think it was maybe too early for that. Uh, then we just have the built-in AC97 audio, and that's that's it. Very bare-bones machine, which makes sense. Only really does the one thing. Seems to do a decent job of it. I imagine you could run any OS you like on here, and most of it would probably work, uh, with the exception of that capture card, which I'm certain is quite proprietary. So let's open this up, and I'll, I'll show you that. Previously in this series, I had mentioned that I hadn't found a source for, for a good electric screwdriver to use for this sort of thing. Now I have the uh, Metabo uh, Nei Hitachi uh, HPT, th this guy, uh, th there we go, DB3D. Just look up Metabo screwdriver on Amazon or whatever. This thing's absolutely fantastic. I'm gonna show you why. It's got a really low power clutch. Like you could definitely get decent power out of it. Yeah, there we go. But when you set it all the way to the minimum position, it basically, Okay, well, I ground out the head on this guy already by turning up the clutch. So that sort of gives you an idea just how uh, cheesy these screws are. But uh, anything with a decent head on it, you can't do any damage. I've even used this on laptops, and I haven't been able to harm anything, even if it was going into plastic. So, uh, yeah, these are super cheap. I think they're like 50 bucks on Amazon. It's not sponsored or anything. Uh, I just uh, finally found something I'm satisfied with. So, uh, yeah, check it out. Anyway, with just three screws, this guy comes open. And unsurprisingly, it's a computer. It is um, a little cramped in here. Let's see if we can take this power supply out. Even with the clutch, I would never risk using an electric driver on these guys. All right, can we make any more room now? Oh, yeah, actually. That worked pretty well. Now, I'm kind of curious. Um, this power supply claims to be from uh, ICP Electronics. That's the second ICP joke that I'm not doing a very good job of making in this series. But I wonder, hmm, I wonder if they actually made this or if they just bought it off the shelf and modified it because it kind of looks like uh, just a generic ODM power supply which they glommed on this filter to. And I'm guessing that's exactly what it is. So as it turns out, this ESD stud over here is, in fact, <laughs> the underlying chassis ground because it goes uh, straight into the power supply. Well, that's inconvenient. But you could basically see the layout of the thing, so I don't think we need to tear it down any further. Uh, that guy down there is a completely ordinary off-the-shelf motherboard. I'm pretty sure that's an Intel desktop board. Yeah, that's an F845GEK. Oh, okay. It's actually a first tech. You know, from the green, I just sort of assumed it would be an Intel desktop board. Uh, by the time this was made, I, I figured everybody had switched to other colors. 
All the same, it might as well be an Intel desktop board because this thing appears to just be straight down the middle. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get a release date for it. Oh, okay, well, at least the Retro Web says it came out in 2002, so a touch earlier than I thought. At any rate, though, that's uh, an Intel 845 chipset, which is just the most straight down the middle, yup, that's a Pentium 4 you could possibly get. So there's nothing interesting about the motherboard itself. I'm more intrigued by a few aspects of the chassis uh, and, of course, the cards. There are some strange things going on with the cards. So, of course, we've got a, a big nasty fan here. That's where all that howling was coming from. I guess I could have unplugged that, but what if the thing overheated? Uh, also, the speaker over here, I, I feel like I don't remember the machine ever making any sounds when I had it running. Maybe I'll fire it back up and see if I can play some audio on it and, and insert a clip right here. Yeah, it works. And if I didn't insert the clip, then that means I couldn't get it working. Uh, we also have, for some reason, a little tiny fan back here, and I'm not really sure what that would be doing. I guess, I guess it's helping exhaust some of the air that's coming out of the CPU here. You've got the power supply sitting right here, and it's at that level, which is right above the CPU. Is this fan exhausting or intaking? I'm still not good at remembering which direction the uh, uh, the, the hub faces. Uh, for intake fans, the sticker should be towards the inside of the case. Okay, so this fan pulls in, and then this fan blows down, right? So, okay, I guess that makes sense. Cold air comes in here, gets shot down through the processor, and then probably gets... Uh, well, where does it get exhausted, now that I think about it? Because this guy also appears to be set up to pull air in. Oh, okay, there's uh, there's holes on either side of the case, so it just uh, pressurizes the case, and then it just pushes out through the sides, so... Nothing exciting there. Here, however, is something a bit more interesting. This is the power button, and you can see that they've just hooked up an ordinary, uh, you know, Radio Shack push button to the motherboard header, and when you hit this, it pushes on that. However, these are the wires for the power LED. They go up into the stock of the push button, and <laughs> they just get crushed every time you hit the button. Now, it is not a matter of opinion. Eventually, those wires are going to fail from the repeated stress. There's absolutely no reason to have done it this way. There are buttons that have built-in lights. They obviously had this button custom made. Why would they not have the wires exit somewhere else? I'm totally baffled. It is one of the most embarrassing design decisions I've ever seen in anything. Come on, guys. Okay, next up, we got the video capture situation. So uh, the various um, composite S-Video and whatnot go through this ribbon cable here from the back panel. I've seen this on a lot of devices that they'll get, you know, really high quality external connectors. Like these are some, you know, BNCs rather than composite and they're, you know, very firmly chassis mounted and you're going to use your best quality coax cable to hook this up. And then you're just going to stick the analog signal straight into this unshielded ribbon cable. So... Yeah, okay, I guess, whatever. I mean, at least it's inside of a shielded box, but a lot of the things in here generate high-frequency signals that are gonna get picked up by this, and the audio is going through there too, and it's just gonna cross-talk to hell with the video, so this is a bad idea. Like, I, I just, I know for a fact this is a bad idea. I'm not even gonna uh, dunk on my own <laughs> level of skill and knowledge here. You shouldn't do this. This is not the right way to do this. I have seen this done in like broadcast gear using micro coax, and that's definitely the right way to do that. Um, in fact, I've, I've seen lots of, of embedded capture cards that used micro coax. So yeah, no, this, um, this is a cop out, this sucks. On the other hand, they did bother to hot glue it down, right? So it's not gonna jiggle its way loose. So at least there's that, uh, which is a problem for me because I wanna remove this, but let's see if we can just take it out with the card. All right, is that adequate? No, we have to take all of these off. Where's my crescent wrench? I think that lower card is actually held in by the same screws uh, that uh, secure the shield for the PCI bracket. Yep, sure enough, they uh, basically... <laughs> Use the bracket for the video uh, capture input daughterboard as a nut for for this thing. That's really funny. 
Eh, it's efficient. I guess I can't get mad. All right, so that should come free now. Terrific. And now we can remove the card. Oh. Oh. <laughs> this actually has a stiffening bar back here. I just realized that. How should I get that out? I think i got to come at it from the bottom. Oh. Mm, okay. I, I guess not. These nuts are screwed onto studs that are pressed into the sheet metal on the bottom, I guess. Oh, that's inconvenient. Ooh, that is in there. Ooh. Needs more force. Well, this is inadvisable. There we go. All right, this card should pop right out now. Right, should just right, could come right, there we go. Oh, oh, we got, we got cables going all over the place. All right, so where do these go? We've got a two pin here, which goes down. I was thinking it might go to the CD-ROM, but it doesn't. Where is that thing headed? To the front panel for some reason. What would it be doing up there? Well, that's really odd. There's um, there's nothing on the front panel that, that I can think of that would be connecting to this. Is there a label for that header? Doesn't seem to be. What on earth is it doing? Uh, okay, I think I can release this front panel without damaging it. This is really fiddly to get off. There we go. Okay, okay. I think it all makes sense now. The, um little uh, plastic bezel around the USB port is translucent. And I thought that was just for looks. I thought it was just a, a style thing because this is from the 2000s. But in reality, there is an infrared sensor behind there, which I think I bent. Oh, no, no. It's got sort of a bulbous front to it. So they had to bend it to get it to fit. But um, this is actually an IR window. So this thing would have had a remote uh, control for triggering a uh, record. And um, that uh, two pin coming off of there loops over to the... Uh, the capture card, and they're just using it as a GPIO to tell the uh, software when to start recording. At least that's what I'm guessing is going on. I do notice these uh, lower two are, are both called audio out, and I don't really know <laughs> what any audio would be doing up here. I don't know what this little board is, is for, for the most part. So this is obviously the USB port, right? And you see it's got the four pins um, uh, in the standard USB colors, uh, green, black, red, and white. I think we're, we're standard for, for USB one and two. Uh, so this is just looping over the motherboard. You can see the traces hop straight over to it. So that's all that is. Uh, and then this guy here would appear to be what's going to the capture card. So I'm guessing that that's just getting you know an amplified signal from this guy. But what's what's with the rest of this? What does any of this stuff do? There's there's these two two pin plugs that say audio out. There's a chip there that for all the world looks like it's probably an op amp. Um, and then this thing is receiving power. So this seems to be an audio amplifier board. Oh, you know what? I wonder if this is nothing more than the amplifier for that uh, that speaker that we saw on the bottom of the case. And they just they were already make, fabricating a board uh, to put the IR sensor and the um, the USB on. So they said, uh, screw it. Let's just go ahead and put the um, the audio amp on there as well. Because where else are they going to put it? Yeah, I think so. Because uh, these two wires here are coming out of another of these uh, little gray cables, and it uh, yep snakes right over there. And then I think we'll find that another of these gray cables, yeah, this is it, goes to right there into the uh, audio header for the onboard sound. So that's exactly what's going on. The line level audio comes out of the sound chip there, travels all the way up to the front, gets amplified, then comes back to the speaker. All right, that was a, a whole series of minor mysteries, but I think we have them all answered now. Oh, except for one. There's also a four pin header right here, but that one I suspect I already have the answer to. This looks exactly like your typical CD-ROM uh, analog audio jumper, and this would plug into your um, your sound card. But I think in this case, because this card here is handling audio capture, yeah, this uh, daughter board here has both the video and the audio inputs on it. So they're basically just piping that audio through the card so that it can capture it uh, and uh, integrate it into the, the video file it's generating. Uh, but then, yeah, it comes over and lands on a header right here, uh, directly next to the uh, AC97 chip. So yeah, that's how they're getting the um, uh, the audio from this thing into the PC's sound system while also being able to capture it at the hardware level. So we're gonna take a look at that capture card in a moment, but first, the reason I wanted to get in here was this card right here. This thing is a doozy, this thing is a mystery. I have no idea uh, what it is, I but I have a theory about what it is. and. 
It's a pretty wild one, but I, I think it holds water. And now that I'm getting a clear look at it, uh, I'm even more convinced that I figured out exactly what it does without even being able to look up the chips on the damn thing. So can we carefully unplug this or is it glued or... Ah, there we go. This is the LVDS cable that feeds uh, the LCD display at the front. Uh, the other thing coming off of that display is this guy here that's going to land on a USB header uh, right there. That's the... Um, the touchscreen input. So uh, that's your video signal and that's your touchscreen signal. And the video comes out of this card right here. Uh, is that glued in? Oh, no. Oh, gosh. Wow. That's an AGP slot with a release? Boy, it's been a really long time since I actually saw one of those. <laughs> All the AGP boards I've worked on in recent memory have been um, uh, pretty damn old and didn't have that thing. So I keep forgetting that it even existed. Ooh. All right. Now that's a mysterious little card. So I'm gonna cut right to the chase here and tell you what I think this thing does. This is not a graphics card. It, it is in the AGP slot, but I, I think it just goes without saying this is not a graphics card. Do you remember that back uh, in Windows, I opened up Device Manager and showed you all the hardware in the machine, and it said that the graphics device was an Intel 82845? Well, the 82845 is under this heat sink here. That is an integrated Intel graphics controller that's part of the 845 Northbridge. To the best of my knowledge and to the knowledge of other people that I've asked, Intel never made that available in an independent format. And, and besides, it just wouldn't really make any sense, right? The only point of an 845 is that it's built into the machine. This, very obviously, is not an 845. That is a Crontel CH7018A-TF. Uh, and what this is doing, dollars to donuts is slurping up the frame buffer from the onboard graphics and converting it to LVDS. I'll bet you that's what this is doing because, and I haven't even looked this up, but I'm still pretty sure I'm right. Uh, AGP does not require uh, the OS to actually have a driver loaded for the device to function. So uh, because it's DMA capable, right? I'm pretty sure uh, this chip can just sit there in the AGP slot and periodically just tell the system, okay, give me the contents of memory at this address, and then just convert it to whatever LVDS, you know, RGB triplets or whatever, and spit it out the uh, port. And that's it. And that's why we didn't see any sort of driver in the operating system to run this thing, because I don't think the OS is even aware that this exists. Now, there's so many part numbers on this thing that I'm pretty sure we'll be able to look up one of them. This appears to be made by uh, Contron, a name I recognize, though I don't know what they do. And it's called AGP ADD LVDS TX. Let's ask the internet. All right, there's our card. The ADD LVDS are AGP cards designed for implementing single and dual pixel LVDS transmitter function to Intel 845 based motherboards. Whoa! Via the AGP digital display interface. Okay, so I was right, but I was wrong. Uh, it is doing exactly what I said it was. However, it's not doing it by cheating. It's doing it by using an actual motherboard function. I then proceeded to make an absolute hash of that explanation. So let's try it again. A couple of videos back, I mentioned the concept of the SDVO card. These were these um, uh, PCIe graphics card looking things that you'd find in computers from like 2006 to 2008, uh, usually OEMs like Dell Optiplexes. And if you put them in any other motherboard, they wouldn't do anything. It turns out that's because they're not graphics cards. When you plug one of these into a PCI slot, sorry, PCIe slot on a compatible motherboard, the chipset detects it and switches that slot into SDVO mode. And in that mode, all it does is treat that card as an extra output for the integrated graphics. So Dell would ship the machine with just VGA or just DVI. And then if you wanted to add another DVI, you'd get one of these cards and install it. And it was extremely inexpensive uh, because it wasn't actually a graphics card. Well, it turns out that the uh, S in SDVO, standing for serial, is much like the S in SATA. Uh, that is to say, it's uh, indicating it's the serialized version of an earlier parallel format. Uh, because there was a DVO, which used AGP to do exactly the same thing. Uh, so that card I was showing you plugs into the AGP slot on an Intel motherboard. And if it has an 845 chipset, as far as I can tell, it's the only one that supported it, uh, then the AGP port actually switches into DVO mode and all it does is take over the uh, graphics output. Uh, like I, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, the VGA port built into the motherboard isn't actually outputting anything. So I think when you plug this in, it, it takes over. 
And I, I guess it'd be really easy to find out, right? Let's just um, take the damn card out. Let's just power up real quick and make sure the uh, onboard hasn't started. Oh my God, no, it's working now. Oh, you know what was going on before? It just clicked. Remember much earlier when I powered this thing on and there was no picture on the screen and I had to turn it off and turn it back on? When I tested the VGA earlier, I had just brought it up from cold, uh, so uh, the machine didn't actually post. This time around, however, uh, since I brought it up from a warm state, I just had this thing on a couple minutes ago, uh, it did successfully post, and uh, we saw an image on the screen over here for a moment. Now, once it got to Windows, it shut off the external output, but that's exactly what you'd expect from a dual-head graphics card, right? Uh, since this has the drivers installed and everything, I would probably have to go into the display settings to uh, turn the VGA back on. Well, it doesn't show multiple monitors, in Windows itself. Oh, uh, let's look at the actual um, Intel control panel. Okay, this looks like it acknowledges it, right? Because notebook uh, is shorthand for the LVDS output. So monitor, you'd think, would be the um, the VGA. Let's apply. Oh, yep, there we go. And if we set this to dual display clone. Outstanding. So it looks like they just configured it to um, uh, default to the LVDS and not bother turning on the VGA but they totally could have turned the VGA on as I just did. Uh, and then you, you would be able to, to connect a separate external capture device to record the user interface of the thing during a procedure. Like I found video files on old capture devices before that were a recording of the desktop of an instrument like this. So uh, there's precedent for it, but I, I can understand why they would not have focused on that need. But you know, one unfortunate thing is I don't think it's possible to run these as independent desktops. Like I could turn on this one or that one, or I can clone them, but I don't think it's possible to extend the desktop to two displays. That's uh, probably why Windows only shows the one monitor here, because you can't actually run it in um, in dual head mode. I don't remember if I've ever seen any 845 motherboards that could do dual head, so maybe that didn't get introduced to Intel HD graphics? That wouldn't surprise me. Anyway, uh, there's that. Let's get back to the teardown. All right, let's uh, take a look at the capture card. I'll be honest, I don't expect to learn much from this exercise because it's just going to be a few uh, jelly bean parts and then an FPGA. There's going to be an FPGA on here. Does anybody think there won't be an FPGA on here? Place your bets, folks. Whoa! Ho, ho, ho! What are you? Siemens Infineon SABC517A-LN. Oof. All right, we'll look that up. Oh, hey! Hey! Would you look at that? It's a pair of Xilinx Spartan FPGAs. And another one, and another one. Do you think there'll be more under here? Do you think there's another under here? Spoiler alert. Yeah. Oh, now, <laughs> you know you're looking at uh, 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 industrial OEM stuff when you've got bodge wires attached to the back of the card because uh, they didn't, they weren't making the thing in a large enough quantity for it to be worth it to throw away a whole run and remake it. But look at what a nice job they've done. Boy, that is a really pretty bodge job. Like, they've done all Manhattan geometry with it, and like these very precisely placed dabs of, is that hot glue? I think that might not be hot glue. I think that might be something just a little bit more professional. This one down here didn't get any glue, but um, you know, it's, it's not at nearly as much risk as these ones were. Oh, and uh, naturally, we've got uh, four memory chips back here. That's going to be your video RAM for uh, captured frames. You know what? I'm so bad at doing the math on how big these are, I probably shouldn't even try. Here. Here's the part numbers. I'll, um, I'll put up what I think is how big they are, <laughs> and then people in the comments can correct me. Oh, and it looks like we've got uh, two more of probably the same chip, uh, these uh, RAM chips here and here. Uh, I do not know what's underneath this heat sink. Like, my gut says another FPGA, but what does my gut know? Judging from the part number, I'd say this is probably a dedicated encoder. Because um, SK8, that's the name of the card. Uh, you might have noticed that in Windows Device Manager, that the uh, SK8 showed up under Sound and Video Devices. That's the, the part number for this whole thing. Um, so I'm guessing this is either another FPGA or it's some dedicated encoder chip. Uh, although the fact that it does MPEG 1, 2, and 4, I don't know that I've seen anything that did all of those at once. So I am kind of thinking custom. Do I think I can get this off without destroying it? There's nothing to safely lever against. Um, yeah, the flathead's going to get in there and it's just going to it's gonna smash up the carrier for the chip. Ooh, well, let's try. 
I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to deball that. So what's going to happen. That thing's uh, probably VGA on there and I'm going to rip it straight off the board. If I do that. So we're never going to learn what's under there. Don't worry. Uh, it wouldn't have meant anything anyway. Just would have been a proprietary part number. So yeah, I don't actually know anything about FPGA, so I can't tell you how good these are, but there are quite a few of them. Uh, given its position, this guy is talking to the PCI bus. Uh, this guy is uh, glue between the rest of this thing and the encoder board. You can see how um, a crap load of traces come in this side and a crap load of traces come out that side, right? So da -da 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 -da, that's obvious enough. These guys are connecting to this header here, so I'm guessing they're both handling half of whatever this does. I'm sort of wondering now uh, what role this guy plays. It seems like I would know a lot more. <laughs> well, apparently this does miscellaneous things. All right, let's let's uh, let's see if this chip comes up with anything. I'm not hopeful. Oh, intriguing. Uh, this is actually just a microcontroller. Huh. So there's no telling what that's doing. And then, of course, the analog devices here. That's going to be straightforward. That's just going to be the uh, analog digital converter. 809887A. Oh, delightful. Uh, this, yeah, this, this runs the whole operation. This is a dual interface... Oh, for flat panel display, actually. Oh, that's cute. You see, this chip here, this is actually the heart of an LCD monitor. So you'd, you'd put this on a PCB, and uh, your your DVI and your VGA uh, go into it, and then it spits out a, a generic RGB format, and then you just put it through a second chip that takes that format and converts it into LVDS of whatever format feeds your panel, and bam, just like that, you got yourself uh, a ready-to-go LCD monitor. Well, um... Uh, this company, uh, Stryker, because this appears to be actually a custom board, it looks like Stryker actually made this in-house for this product. Uh, they realized, I guess, that, um, hey, that's a capture card, right? If what we're handling is DVI and VGA, then uh, what's the point in getting like a generic um, analog digital converter? Let's just go with something that's already designed to turn that into a standard digital format. So basically, they just let this guy handle the input, whatever resolution it gets, whatever format, whether it's DVI, VGA, whatever, it converts into a standard uh, 422 uh, bit stream, uh, which just gets shipped over to the encoder card that uh, probably uh, turns it into MPEG-1, 2, or 4. That's very clever, if, if I'm understanding it correctly. They're essentially just using the Xilinx chips as glue between these, uh, these various parts. Uh, oh, and uh, there are just a few relays on here, which I'm a little curious about because... Well, let's see. So you would not need them to select inputs because the uh, device here is meant to select between DVI and VGA, right? Right? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be anything in here about uh, needing to switch the signal externally. And uh, there is some uh, some stuff in the uh, the block diagram here about having an integral MUX. So yeah, I, I strongly suspect that this thing uh, can select DVI or VGA itself. Uh, what I'm wondering is whether these relays are actually set up to do uh, hardware level pass through. So if you power off the machine, these relays drop and just short the uh, uh, critical signals between uh, the two ports so that uh, if the machine is dead, you don't lose your picture on the preview screen. Because that would suck right? <laughs> um, if the if the signal's coming in here and it's getting adjusted by the capture card and then this thing blows a fuse, okay, sure, it sucks that you're not getting the recording, but the far more important thing is that the doctor can't see what he's doing now, okay? So uh, I'm thinking that's, that's what these are for. Uh, these are probably like um, uh, two to six pole each, so it's probably why there's an odd number of them here. I was initially thinking it was like RGB and HV, but that would only be applicable to the VGA. Uh, but if each one of these has a number of poles, then it could probably actually switch all the DVI signals between these in one go. Likewise, uh, these relays over here probably select between uh, composite inputs one or two, because, oh yeah, now that I think about it, I don't know what's doing the composite decoding on here. Oh, <laughs> it's probably that guy right there. Yeah, SAA7128, that's a Philips... Uh, encodes digital CBYCR video data to an NTSC PAL or CCAM CVBS signal. Oh, I'm sorry, that's actually for output. Oh, okay, they have a, a pair of devices here, because remember that uh, for the composite signal, they inject uh, extra overlay data onto it that says, like, whether it's recording or, or um, uh, displays the photos you've already taken whenever you take a snapshot. So they have to actually um, re-encode the data. Uh, oh, this guy here is different. This is an SAA... 7113 that's probably doing the decoding yeah here we go nine bit video input processor so basically uh this chip takes the compositor s video input converts it into a digital format 
uh, the uh, software does whatever it's going to do with it, and then writes the OSD info back onto the image and sends it to this chip, which spits it back out over the, uh, the ripple through. So uh, this is not, in fact, doing a hard cut through. When, when you're plugging in your, um, your video monitor to this, you're not actually seeing the exact same uh, signal that came out of the camera. So in fact, for this to be low latency, they're either doing that overlay in hardware, which wouldn't surprise me. One of the, the Xilinxes could definitely be doing it. Uh, or they've just um, gotten the software to be very responsive. I guess the only remaining question about this would be how they're doing the um, audio conversion, because I don't offhand see a chip for that. I am curious about this silicon image down here. In fact, there's two chips down here. Let's see. ADV7123. I wonder if that's the uh, audio. Uh, no, that is actually a triple 10-bit high-speed video DAC. Oh, okay. Um, so they're probably using that to um, transmogrify the VGA signal as well. Oh, I should have tried passing a VGA signal through this thing. Maybe I'll inject a clip of that right here if I can get it working. So with VGA, it works exactly as expected. If I shut the machine down, you should see here in a moment that the image disappears and then reappears a moment later. And you can actually hear the relays drop, so it works exactly as I expected. But it looks like it's only affecting the VGA pins because uh, when I ran DVI through this thing, it did not pass through the signal with the power off or on. And while this won't actually accept the DVI signal, if it's being passed through by the relays, then it wouldn't matter what this thing expects, right? It would just be contacts closing, and my monitor should still be able to uh, pick up the image even if the PC can't, but it couldn't. So I don't think that they have cut through for DVI. And then as for the silicon image, that's a uh, SIL164CTG64. Hate that part number. That is a silicon image panel link transceiver. Oh, okay, and that's um, probably what's being used to generate the uh, ripple through uh, DVI signal. So yeah, I think, I think this actually is touching all these signals. I initially had assumed that the DVI and or VGA might just get passed through unchanged, uh, but I'm guessing now that the... Um, uh, the overlay, the OSD, probably gets applied to all of them, which makes sense. I mean, why would you only want to do it with the composite if you were bothering to, to offer this this option? Oh, and then these chips here ended up being audio attenuators. Um, this is the connector that loops over to the motherboard, and these look like they're probably attached to it. I think when I speculated that the this was used for capturing audio and video, I'm now thinking that that's wrong. I think it just takes the audio, sends it through these attenuators, and then out to the motherboard and lets the onboard sound card do the audio capture. Because uh, these guys here are used for um, digitally decreasing the volume of a signal. So you pass uh, the mic through these, and then the software can decrease the volume down to nothing. Now, you might wonder, why not just do it through the Windows uh, volume mixer? And I, too, wonder that. <laughs> I'm not sure why they would need to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's got to be it, because I don't see an audio uh, interface on here anywhere. No, once again, I am incorrect. This is a Crystal CS4221 audio codec, analog digital and digital to analog conversion right here on the bottom. Yeah, it just happens to be in the same neighborhood as that connector, so I can imagine these are actually connecting to that through a... Um, uh, through some vias so it's probably uh just rippling the uh, the raw audio straight through the motherboard here and then adjusting the volume with these guys uh for the benefit of this chip oh and hey would you look at that one more xilinx for good measure a five fpga device that's four and then a bonus in case you get hungry later so that was um Mildly interesting. That's the best way I could put it. I, I mean, it's a cool chassis. It's a well-made device. You know, this is all um, uh, pretty unjanky, other than the, <laughs> the silly power button. Uh, I generally approve of all the decisions Stryker made here. I think it's wild that they made what appears to be a, a custom video capture card. I don't think I've ever seen that done before, other than by uh, by New Tech for the um, uh, the various video toasters and, and TriCasters. Uh, it's kind of a shame, because I, I don't think I'm going to be able to use this in anything else. So... Probably this thing is going to have to stay together exactly as it is in order to be at all useful. And I say that's a bummer only because as a chassis, this this thing is, is interesting. You know, it, it, it makes you have thoughts about stuff you could do with it because it's got this um, this nice touchscreen on here. It was um, fairly clear and, and the, 
the touch panel itself works fairly reliably. The trouble is it's 800 by 600, right? Which is just, it's not enough resolution for a lot of stuff I'd want to do. If I had my druthers, I would set this above my workbench here because I've got like a full tower PC up there with a uh, some modern GeForce card that's doing the video capture whenever I'm recording uh, from uh, VGA or HDMI or anything. And it's just a big hulking beast with a separate monitor and whatnot. And it's just doing one task. So I would love if I could just put, you know, a modern board in here and like a, a quadro from a few years ago and, and run Windows 10 on it and, and OBS. But I, I think doing that at 800 by 600 would just be too cramped and, and unpleasant. And besides that, I'm kind of limited by this, um, this DVO situation because, well, I've never seen this um, LVDS connector before. So I don't think I'll be able to get another card that's got that on it. And that's the only way to talk to this panel uh, and while I could probably put this card into any board that has an 845 chipset that's only going to be AGP era boards uh, none of which are new enough that I could reliably do you know 1080p and higher capture on them I don't think so I'm kind of stuck with this machine the way it is I don't think I'll be able to do anything useful with it um, you know by by modern standards but like I said the whole thing just sort of screams useful you know there's got to be something I can do with it like, for instance, because it does use generic Intel hardware, I'm sure I could run any Linux on this, right? Because the, uh, the 845 chipset's well-supported. And if I'm understanding this thing correctly, like I said, it doesn't need any drivers. So if I run Linux on this, it should show up on the LCD, right? I mean, we saw a brief flash of the BIOS when this thing was starting up, so clearly it doesn't require any special support. And modern Linuxes will run on some pretty old hardware reasonably well, so I feel like I could use that to shoehorn some functionality into this thing, but... I couldn't think of anything today, and I don't want to drag this out, you know, with a, with a bunch of just, like, piddling around that doesn't amount to anything. So maybe there'll be a follow-up video on this thing someday if I figure out a really cool thing to do with it. Anyway, that's all i got to say about it. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for watching. Um, this was a, a fun, quick one to make. If you enjoyed this, then uh, consider subscribing to my channel. Um, I try to make stuff like this as often as I can. The Little Guy series will be going on basically for eternity, I think. Uh, although I will be mixing in other stuff much more frequently as we go forward and the, the weather gets a little bit more tolerable. So remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new stuff. Uh, but if you really like this and you want to help me out, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. Uh, this is my full-time job, uh, so there's the only reason that I can afford to buy things like this when uh, I get messages from people saying, Hey man, check out this wild thing I found. Uh, but of course, they're also um, the only reason that I have time to sit around and look at things like this. So I'm incredibly grateful to all my patrons for making this possible. Thank you all so much. And to everyone else, thanks for watching.